Edinburgh University. Please, Jonathan. Thank you very much, Hendrik, and um, thank you indeed to uh, everybody involved in this fascinating uh, meeting, particularly to Luciano, David and Indre for inviting me. So I'm Jonathan Seckel. I'm the Senior Vice Principal of the University of Edinburgh, which is a comprehensive university about as far north as you can go. Um, and um, my, my background is medicine. I'm an expert on what stress hormones do to the brain, but I spend most of my time pushing pens around various pieces of paper at the moment. I also chair a number of major UK funding bodies. So I chair the grant committees that people apply to and fully understand the challenges of interacting between STEM and what we actually call not SSH, but SHAPE, social sciences, humanities, arts, for people and economics. So it's to talk about how you actually can persuade funders and politicians of the importance. And I think that's been the thing that's been slightly missing in this conversation so far. We haven't really talked about the drivers beyond the university very much. You know, what is it in politicians, policy makers, uh, funders' minds that they're looking for from us in order to give us money, in order for us to do research, in order to come up with solutions to the wicked, complicated global problems that we all face at the moment. I mean, there's a pandemic going on. Um, I spent yesterday chairing a, a government committee giving money to people who want to come up with solutions to aspects from social sciences through to medical sciences of the pandemic. And of course, these are immediately in our mind, but there's lots of other things. Uh, you know, how do universities improve the effect effectiveness or new produce new products with industry? How do we work together with industry? How do we form? How do we establish new new activities? How do we work with public services? How do we increase high value jobs? How do we skill? All sorts of things that will persuade policymakers if we make the case right for the interaction between STEM and SSH or SHAPE in, in my terms. So in order to start thinking about those issues, we have now an A grade panel of colleagues, five of us, who are going to give very short presentations. And because we're late and because I'm interested in stress, I'm going to stress all of you by saying you don't have five minutes, you've got two minutes. And I'm a wicked chair, so you've got to be really quick. And make your case, state a point, and then let's have a discussion. Because I think the discussion, rather than talking at each other, we should try, even in the complexities of this format, to talk with each other. So enough from me. And we start with Oliver Kuttle, who's Head of International Affairs and Delegate to the President at the uh, Polytechnic in Lausanne. Thanks a lot, Jonathan. So uh, let me give an example. I will be very quick, but you know, that's an example which just came across. And Jonathan, you just men mentioned the COVID crisis. So actually, probably, I don't know whether you're aware, so at DPFL, together with ETH Zurich, we developed this, what is called the DB3T. So it's the decentralized privacy preserving proximity tracing app, which actually now is implemented in many European countries. So it was launched here at DPFL together with friends at ETH Zurich. So we were happy, we got 4 million from private foundation. We did develop a technological solution and it worked out brilliantly. It's really a nice solution. Now, what happened? So actually in Switzerland, I don't know how this was in the other European countries. So we had a technical solution. The app was on the market. You can download it from, app, from the app stores and, and Google. And even we managed to convince Apple and Google, you know, to integrate it in their operation system. Now, what happened is that in Switzerland, so we were delayed by another one, six weeks, because the legislator said, you know, this app, you cannot just allow it to download it. So we need uh, uh, to, to create a new law. This was the first point. The second one, once this was done, which actually everybody could download it, there was a big resistance in, in, in the population in Switzerland, you know, and fearing that this, this app would actually, you know, somehow it raised concern about the privacy. And this app was designed it's by design, it's, 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 it's really done on privacy. So actually, 
this is exactly the point. So we had a technical solution. We were quite rapid in developing it. We didn't think about the legal aspect. We didn't think about how could the, the public perceive the solution, even though it's much more private than anything you do on Google nowadays. But so this was completely omitted. And that's exactly at the core of our discussion. So from the beginning on include all these reflections not it's not just about technology it's much more about you know how the population how society will actually take a new technology on board spot on as a key argument for why this multidisciplinary interaction is vital to get solutions in a real world otherwise you produce solutions that nobody wants fantastic david you've already introduced yourself so would you like to tell us what you think in two minutes Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. What thrills me is exactly this focus on impact and the necessity to include a much wider uh, community of stakeholders than the traditional um, triple helix and triple helix. Um, what I also found really interesting is the uh, argument of the serendipity made by our colleagues from, uh, from Lausanne. We often do not know where we go and we need to be ready to use um, uh, changes uh, or un un unexpected happenings. So there are very high transaction costs. What I think we should be considering is learning from research infrastructures, uh, the European Strategy Forum, where the Commission, member states, and scientific communities develop ideas, a roadmap, and where effectively the evaluation has been adjusted and um, cut into two. At the evaluation of the scientific uh, excellence impact and outreach by scientific experts as opposed to the assessment of management and implementation i think such an approach would allow us to sort of move towards a life cycle based model um, geared towards the implementation and maturity and i think uh, an essential thing what s3 does in its evaluations and assessments is that they do not stop with providing conclusions for uh, about uh, a proposal but they they provide uh, clear cut and concrete recommendations on how to move towards uh, maturity and implementation of these real solutions uh, and in this sense it allows for flexible and emerging pathways so my plea would be to add a new dimension in our assessments, the one of management implementation provided with concrete recommendations and engage sort of a portfolio of ideas that we bring concretely to solutions. Thank you, Jonathan. Super. That's really good. And I like the notion of iteration between panel and applicants in order to come up, you know, instead of a binary, you know, binary decision, yes, no because it's got one little flaw, you say, okay, we like this, now work on this issue, but let's stay consistent in our conversations to real world problems. Fantastic, brilliant, thank you, David. Right, now we have Jens Kreisel, who's Vice Rector for Research at the University of Luxembourg. Hi, thank you, thank you very much. Um, um, within the two minutes, I would like to address um, the slippy slope of terms and how we describe these things. The first thing is we've been discussing about impact and I've noticed internally at the university, whenever I talk about socioeconomic impact, that our technologists understand economic. And when I speak to sociologists and people in uh, humanities, they also understand economics. So basically we often the social economic impact, but no one is hearing the word social. So what I've been adopting in terms of language that I always speak consciously of social impact, of economic impact, and I think this is very important, we don't say often enough, of cultural impact as well, which is very important for, for many people. I would like to say on this also that the community of social science and humanities often should have perhaps more self-confidence. I was very surprised that they always come in and say, oh, we're always in the back of technology and no one cares about us. And when I went to people who are radio presenters, TV presenters, they said, well, that's not true. People love to hear about history. They know that most of the articles are in history, they are left. So a bit more of self confidence This is the first slippery slope of how to formulate things. So socioeconomic impact is not a good term, I've experienced. The second slippery slope I would like to talk about is uh, 
um, going from interdisciplinarity to intersectoriality. Um, this is something you observe quite a bit in European um, uh, projects uh, where interdisciplinarity is not as much present as we would like, but they always speak about intersectoriality, and this is linked to the term of impact. The term intersectorial suits very well in hard science, like engineering and biology and all the kind of things, because we've got different economic sectors. But I'm not sure that it is a term that suits very well social science and humanities. Uh, where the term sector is much differently uh, defined. So um, uh, with this, I will just finish, but say when we address perhaps a, 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 a short letter to the European community, we should ought to pay attention to the words we use and how they are interpreted on their side. Yeah, so semantic accuracy and precision. Of course, it's, it's the sine qua known of being an academic is to use precision in your terminology. I agree with that. Uh, the sectoral issue you can get through in the uh, shape SSH sub subjects because actually we relate to aspects of the real world. And I think that's the, the thing, you know, does it relate to the financial world? Does this relate to the cultural world? Does this relate to interactions with social services? All sorts of things that are actually uh, are straightforward enough. And we heard very nicely um, from Aaliyah uh, a little while ago about you know the development of language and the use of language in the home and the use of it to try and think about how people talk about food and therefore how they might misuse food. So these are really important issues for everybody. There's not a family that's not addressed by that. Yes, okay. But are we sure that Europe, if you say to Europe intersectorial, that's what they understand? My feeling is they understand something else when they speak about this. Okay, so we'll be precise about economic sectors, I, I, I fear. Fantastic. Now, uh, Mariam is head of the Office for Research at Stockholm University, um, a fine place, even further north than I am at the moment. Um, <laughs> and you're going to give us two minutes. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, many of the things that I was thinking of uh, bringing up is uh, already been said. And giving the time, I try to sort of summarize what I've heard and what we see every day in when we are in contact with researchers. Well, the, the nature of uh, interdisciplinary research is basically a holistic approach. Uh, and we all, and I don't think I need to convince anybody here that uh, many of these projects uh, can lead to breakthroughs and results beyond the, the state of the art today. Um, but I have uh, thought that we see a lot of challenges here uh, and uh, I have challenges from different perspectives. If we start with the funders, uh, many of these projects are uh, risky projects, uh, high risk, high, uh, high gain. Um, and many researchers, they actually get out of their comfort zone they start to not to only talk to their colleagues within their own disciplines, they need to talk to other people. And this is, this is something that I think many, many funders also have problem with because they're, they're, the whole idea of funding research maybe has become more and more funding you know, different disciplines. Uh, so we need to, to think of uh, some sort of, the funders need at least to think of some kind of a venture capital for, for interdisciplinary research. You know, not being afraid of having research projects that actually do not deliver what they think they will deliver. Um, we already talked about evaluation process. I think we need to have better guidance for, for, for evaluators, but also for the researchers uh, that uh, write the proposals. Um, what do they expect? Uh, and in this context, we, we talked about the European Union, we maybe talk about the national funders, the governmental funders. Uh, I think we have a group of private foundations that may play an, an important role if we start to have a good conversation with them, you know, because they're not as much in you know they can be more flexible they can react fastly and they can realize that this is this is a societal challenge that we need to solve right now and we need to have funding for it so 
I definitely would encourage many many institutions to have a good dialogue a dialogue with their private foundations. In Sweden, we have Wallenberg Foundation, which is the largest private foundation. Uh, they fund a lot of risky projects and and a lot of very good projects. Uh, so that would be my my uh, uh, one of my tips for the institutions and higher education. We talked about seed money. I thought the contingency fund was very interesting. I've never uh, been in touch with it, but we do have seed money to stimulate collaboration between different uh, faculties. I think institutions here again, we talked about risk. They, we need to talk about being brave. Uh, the institutions need to be more brave about you know, starting centers and do not be afraid that centers may not exist in five or 10 years because we don't have the same um, questions to address. Um, to the researchers, be curious, be persistent. Uh, we also talked about impact. I think definitely addressing the impact would help also uh, the researchers writing the proposal to, to understand each other. Um, and of course, there is a disciplinary culture that we need to uh, work on. We need to be more open to each other and how, how different disciplines work. And please, please do not hijack each other. We normally talk a lot about the SHH uh, researchers being hijacked in a larger project and they don't feel like you know, they are really contributing. Uh, they are sort of part of being uh, in a in a in a project that uh, needs funding, and so so we have one one researcher with from SSH, and we're fine. Uh, I think I stop here. Thank you. That's very clear. And I think you make a. I mean, first of all, it, these we are talking about partnerships of equals. We are not talking about tokenism here. So I think that that's a that again is a is is an obvious, but it's been well stated. Uh, it's also important to recognize that as funders become, particularly governments become more challenge led, actually this drives towards interdisciplinarity or multidisciplinarity. I mean, if you think, for example, to solve the problems of providing clean water to a low or middle income country, to develop the sort of technologies required for that, of course, you need engineers and biologists, etc. Hey, forget it. What you need is anthropologists because you've got to come up with solutions that are acceptable to the people who you're putting the system into because they may well say well i don't want that that's that that, that goes against uh, my my religious beliefs or something like that and then of course you need legal and economic and all the other skills in order to produce practical solutions so absolutely agree fantastic finally in this section, we have David Peterson, who's Professor of Impact Studies and Science Communication at Aalborg University in Copenhagen. David. Thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure to be joining the seminar this morning. Um, as was already mentioned in my title, I'm a researcher of impact and have been doing a lot of impact studies. So uh, it will not come as a big surprise to most of you that I'm going to second uh, the focus on impact and and the uh, and live impact and and a more outcome focused uh, way of conducting research be the pathway to better interdisciplinarity and to a much more coherent integration of SSH within uh, not STEM led but let's say STEM um, um, oriented projects. I think really that uh, the moment we turn our lights towards uh, the outcomes it becomes much more tangible uh, for policymakers how to in include SSH. So one example that I have been involved in myself has been the setting up of a huge multi-million uh, research funding project in Denmark on algorithms and democracy. And uh, immediately after you start contemplating what does uh, algorithmic governance look like or what does it, what does it mean to be living in, an, in a democracy that's going to be assisted by automated decision making, you cannot but think about the humanities and social sciences. There is no way out of it. I mean, it's built in from the beginning that a problem like algorithmic governance or um, algorithmically assist assisted um, uh, democracy will uh, in its nature call upon expertise 
uh, from SSH. And I think other examples that have been mentioned today, like the COVID-19 um, uh, uh, pandemic and our response capacity has been immensely embedded in, in SSH-oriented research from communication science to behavioral research. Um, so, so these are good examples. Uh, the moment you start thinking about these topics, as has been already said, ethics, law, anthropology, design thinking, and obviously computer science and engineering all comes into the mix. Um, I had the pleasure last year to visit uh, the Center for um, Human-Centric uh, Artificial Intelligence at, um, at Stanford University. And they have forgotten, they have now given up on taking an interdisciplinary approach. They do what they call post-disciplinarity or even anti-disciplinarity. They do not want to work disciplinary when they are trying to grasp and, and handle these big challenges. It might be that researchers are then recruited for a period of time coming from uh, more disciplinary backgrounds, obviously, but as long as they work together, they work across disciplines um, for a common purpose. And we have had some success um, uh, convincing policymakers and also private foundations in Denmark to take a more mission-oriented or outcome-oriented approach to SSH integration. And then let me finally say, that um, I totally agree with the focus on impact here and, and also both on academic impact and societal impact. I think we should become better at speaking about this dual impact or triple impact if we were also to add the economic one and not see them as each other's opposite, but really as uh, drivers for each other's fulfillment. Um, when we visited uh, institutions like Stanford or MIT, uh, you know, they are working um, deeply interdisciplinary, but they're not afraid of their academic excellence. They're not afraid of losing their citations or being expelled from the good journals. Quite the opposite. Thank you. Fantastic. Very clear and a beautiful exposition of where we are. So for the last 10 minutes before we run out of time, let's have a discussion of this and put it together. And, and I'd like a discussion that's rather than uh, reiterative of the issues now starts trying to propose solutions so we can have that within the panel but also from outside and I'm looking for hands up and not seeing any so let's start the panel discussion going and um, in particular you know these big problems we're talking about the so-called wicked problems that can only be even begun to be improved by people from all sorts of skill sets working together is that a comfortable setting? Yes, please, Olivier. Well, actually, I mean, it was already said many times, but I guess this, you know, the first step which actually should be done is that funders, you know, looking at all the challenges we have to solve on this planet, there's probably not one single challenge which can be solved just by technology. So from the outset on, we need the kind of a common approach, including everybody, to find solution and so this would be kind, you know, to all the funders, uh, being it national, regional, or European, whatever. I mean, to solve big challenges, it needs this collaboration among different disciplines. And this should be in the call and meaning. And then actually you don't need to say you have to integrate and you have to integrate 10% or 20% of the budget. It's just, it, it's, it's, it's a part of, and the project will be evaluated based on actually what you were asking in the call and there actually the social, the, the, the economic impact, whatever the environmental impact is part of the evaluation. And then you have just to make sure that your evaluation panel is fine. And then actually I probably will solve a lot of those issues. Yeah, very helpful. David? Thank you very much. Uh, the big question in, in, in all of this is to what degree are politicians, policymakers, writers of call text actually fit for purpose? And uh, I have the feeling um, that uh, from what we hear, um, serendipity and, 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 and such creeds have been made, we have to be very careful and actually allow for research at rather low TRL and not just follow vested interests uh, in, in, in agendas that have been set. So low TRL, bottom up. Now that of course brings us back to the question the previous speaker has brought in uh, the last panelist. How can we assure um, 
that we stay focused on the outcome and on the practical solution. And I think one of the things we have seen in, in all of this is that the engagement of a variety of relevant stakeholders going well beyond uh, the vested interest is crucial to have um, disruptive innovations providing these solutions to the problems. And that brings high transaction costs. And I think rather than arguing we should bring them into the evaluation, I think we have to bring them into the consortia and help defining these societal problems and finding the solutions. Yeah. David Peterson. Yeah. Thank you. I, I very much agree with what David just said there. I think that's crucial uh, way forward. Uh, and also, and, and this is not a criticism, but um, I have myself been involved as a policy advisor, both to the Danish government and the European Commission for now more than 10 years. And we have been uh, from the SSH community very strongly motivated by this advocacy role to argue and showcase what we are doing and also showcase the numbers when things are not going our uh, directions in terms of integration and performance on, 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 the, on, the, EU, on the EU grants and, um, and calls. But I think we should kind of double up our game and say we also need to inspire policymakers. We need to make it clear, as, as many uh, excellent speakers this morning have said, that you cannot solve these uh, challenges without the SSH component even taking a major lead. So if we're able to inspire policymakers, it will become more evident that SDGs, uh, artificial intelligence, um, the future pandemic response capacity, none of these issues will be handled or will be, will be effectively um, uh, addressed by society without the SSH component. And then you start getting the policymakers to think, oh, they're actually not asking for money or they're actually not just wanting to make their case heard they are actually part of the contribute part of the solution correct and that's and that's going to be absolutely critical in all of this if i re read into the draft um, recommendations coming out of this it's a bit apologetic it's a bit you know give us some money and and and, and, and that's not the way to do it it's we are the solution we are the solution here are the problems this is the solution of course you're going to give us some money because we as a very broad grouping are the solution. Jens. Yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm happy that you bring this up again. It comes back to being more self-confident. I think that's very much uh, important. I would, however, like to make a, a different point. We, I think we have all an agreement that when it comes to, to, to impact and in large industrial and large societal problems and interdisciplinarity is a solution to it. Um, my, my experience is that very often those people who are up at the more higher TRL levels, whatever it means in different fields, they're very much aware of this because whenever you collaborate with, with society or with industry, uh, it immediately comes up. But I wouldn't like us to forget really also the importance of interdisciplinarity and not intersectoriality, interdisciplinarity on the fundamental level in blue sky research. These people are much more often uh, in their disciplinary silos because they've got perhaps a, a less obligation to go interdisciplinary. But ultimately, if we want to have later on a stack of interdisciplinary experts and an interdisciplinary uh, stuff coming up bottom up, we, I think we, we should use the, the um, impact part as a vector to get more funding. Um, and, and more recognition, etc. But that's, that's not all. I think we should not forget about the interdisciplinarity in fundamental research. And I think David uh, said something in that direction as well. I wouldn't like to go only into the uh, application or, or higher tier corner. Sure. I think that, that, that's exactly right. And thank you for reminding us about the fundamental research. One of the ways of breaking down some of the disciplinary boundaries would be to stop doing purely disciplinary education. And we might think of, uh, of, 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 of undergraduate and postgraduate degrees with considerably more than just one theme running throughout it. Uh, I, I think this is a trick that universities have not grasped very well, particularly on this side of the Atlantic. And I suspect there's an opportunity there. Final comments, because we're right out of time. Anybody want to say something? Yes, Jens. 
Yeah, <clears throat> I just wanted to say um, um, what you've been addressing really is the systemic view of it. That means uh, having had in, into education and making interdisciplinary people. But the other systemic one, which has been addressed in one of the talks, which I believe is equally important, is how interdisciplinarity is valued in the assessment of all researchers. I think it is very clear that if, uh, if I had to give an advice to a postdoctoral researcher for finding a job, then the disciplinary, disciplinary way is possibly still the more secure one. And as long as the, our research assessment system is not changing, um, they only start doing interdisciplinary research once they are permanent. I think that's right, and I think that's correct, and I think it's extraordinarily difficult. But the very best of the early career researchers, and my university has just appointed very large numbers of them over the last few years, um, are completely fearless when it comes to interdisciplinary research. They don't see the barriers that most of us have spent our career being hemmed in by. They just go out and do, because we, we just sim sim simply said we're taking the barriers down. We're interested in, in what, you, what you're able to do and not what it's called or which journal you publish in as if that mattered. Final word, David Beaumont. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Um, we were involved in a process to look at uh, the transformation agenda of higher education and we had quite some discussions there and it seems that we have reached a point in this discussion around STEAM, STEM or whatever shake you call it, uh, where we have a lot of ideas of uh, the different models. Um, I, I fully subscribe your notion that it uh, has to go deeply into education and training as well and I think there are some reports around about innovative STEM education for example where we see challenge-based education, for example, in Aalborg. But so so um, we have ideas of different models, but we don't really know which models work at the moment. Uh, there's work on going uh, under Erasmus, uh, two peer learning exercises. We expect reports from them by next summer. And we, as, a, as of Cesar, um, this is part of a broader trajectory where we look uh, indeed uh, into, into these uh, different models of um, STEAM and STEM and interdisciplinary research and, and, and transdisciplinary research. We'll publish a white paper on this. And it's very much directed towards the question, what works and what does not work and how can, uh, what kind of conclusions and recommendations can we provide? In this sense, Jonathan, I would like to thank you and everyone in this room, uh, all the presenters, all the speakers, all the attendees. This was extremely insightful. Uh, your point is well taken about the tonality of the, of the document. We'll do our best to improve, be back uh, with you all. Uh, most likely in two rounds, first with the speakers and panelists and then maybe the participants. And uh, I very much look forward to have a concrete outcome of this workshop and um, hopefully also impact. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all very much. And I think this um, concludes our workshop just about on time. Most grateful to everyone. Bye bye now. Thank you very much. Bye.